it's it's something we can uh, we can ask Gareth A. Davis, who's on the line right now. Gareth, good morning to you. A very good morning, gentlemen. How are you very doing? Good morning. How's it going? Uh, well. I've been trying to get my Skype working to come on your show. I've been running around a, a very old country house stroke castle here in Chepstow in Wales. So uh, my apologies. I'd love to have been on with you uh, about 10 minutes earlier. No worries, no worries. Better late than never. Always, yeah, always. Gareth, uh, interesting question here from Owen in terms of the philosophy and, and style that we would expect to see somebody like Anthony Joshua uh, evolve into, really, as the, the course of his career progresses. What do you expect from him this weekend? Do you expect any changes in how he approaches this fight? Well, he's talking about changes, how he's been working harder on his jab, consulting with Vladimir Klitschko, which I think is fascinating, through Jonathan Banks, Vladimir Klitschko's uh, trainer, of course, before he retired, um, who'd worked under Manny Stewart. Um, he's talking about wanting to be the best version of himself. Now, you could say this is all just words and rhetoric, and at the moment, he and Joseph Parker are indulging in what is really a phony war, and all the hype ends, you know, Saturday night when that first bell rings. But I do think he's genuine about it. I think he's, I think he is a work in progress who wants to progress that work of, uh, as quickly as possible, if I can kind of give you that tautology. But the, I think, the, the, I think the, the key with Anthony Joshua is, in his last two fights, they were in front of huge, huge um, uh, crowds, 80,000, 90,000, 80,000 at Wembley Stadium and Principality Stadium. Um, we know how big those stadiums are. You know, a lot of your fans of your show follow the rugby as well. We know what occasions they have in that stadium. Um, so he, and he's also fought 21 rounds in his last two fights. And we learned against Vladimir Klitschko that he has a chin he can recover from. He has heart and he has stamina. He has a second win during fights. So I think we are seeing a guy who's progressing. I do think he's probably 60, 70 percent of what he's going to be eventually. And if he can win five more times, he's going to increase you know, five more times in a row, his abilities and his, uh, um, his, his skill set and his, his body shape and his body form, he's lighter than he was before. All these things are going into making him a better fighter every time. And to answer the second part of your question, even though it's a very long answer to the first part, what will we see on Saturday night? I think we'll see a more cultured Anthony Joshua. I still think he's going to be the punching beast that he always is. But he's, he's talking about being more cultured. That will happen, I think, if Joseph Parker doesn't get under his jab and land some combinations and, and flutter his brain a little bit. Because um, I think if Anthony Joshua controls it, he wants a box like that. Sounds like Klitschko. But if, uh, if, if Parker, who, who I think is obviously smaller, faster, can get in and out and land combinations, I think Anthony Joshua will engage with him more. We were just speaking before you came on air there, Gareth, about Joshua's comments this week talking about becoming or potentially becoming the smartest fighter in the world. What was your read on that? What, what do you think he meant by that? Do you think he meant in terms of the, the, his selection of fights, his actual tactics in the ring? or Because I was thinking that potentially he means an early exit maybe or, or an exit at the right time because we know how mortality can be questioned in the heavyweight fight game. Well, he's talking about fighting for 10 more years, Owen. I mean, I think that, you know, um, uh, um, his, he, wants, he wants 20 more fights. He wants to get to 40 fights. Uh, um, so I don't, I think when he, when, by, by being the smartest, I think he means in terms of the way he was saying, I, I remember asking him the question. It was a sit down with um, the national newspaper media on, uh, on, on the Wednesday of his training camp in Sheffield last week. It was a week ago. And it was about, in fact, a week ago this time. And, um, uh, and, and he was saying that, because I was asking him about being the, the baddest man on the planet, what that means to him, you know, because the heavyweight champion is, uh, is often referred to that. It was, of course, referred to, first of all, or it was self-referred by Mike Tyson, I and Mike Tyson, the baddest man on the planet. And Joshua was saying, no, that's not what I am. I don't want to be that. The guy I look up to, the guy I kind of model myself on, if you like, who I think has been really smart, is Floyd Mayweather. He's been the smartest guy on the planet. So I think he's referring more to the way of boxing. Yes, I agree with you. He, he's talking about not... He's trying to minimize the number of punches he's going to take. But I think he also means being the smartest guy in terms of, um, you know, he's got these kind of uh, mores that he uses. That, you know, less is more. Um, he doesn't, do, doesn't overburden himself with, with public uh, engagements. 
Um, when he's in camp, he's in camp. He does a couple of media days. That's it. Um, and, and, you know, when he's on holiday, he goes away. He's not kind of photographed by paparazzi leaving big kind of extravagant do's and, and galas. And I think that's the point. He's just smart in everything he does. Yeah, I mean, that is fundamentally different from Floyd, who owns a strip club and um, likes to engage in um, the celebrity of being one of the world's biggest gamblers. But maybe just to divorce the conversation. Different personalities, though, yeah. Joe, aren't they, you know? Yeah, I think so. And, and so... I, like I, I can see what he's trying to do. He, he's trying to become um, somebody who has longevity as the heavyweight champion of the world, which is impossible, really. To you know, yeah. you're utterly reliant on not walking into a bigger right hand than you've ever done exactly. before, or moving your head accidentally one way, and exactly. suddenly you're off balance and you're out, and then all of your plans, as Mike Tyson would say, have uh, have gone awry. Um, just the, the challenge that he faces this weekend. Um, how ready? is his opponent to actually step up to this level? Um, it's a very good point. I, I think he is ready. I think he's, you know, he hasn't looked great in all his recent contests. But then again, you know, we always say that styles make fights. And these two guys have styles that do marry very well. They both like to engage. Um, I suspect that Anthony Joshua wants to counterpunch more against um, Anthony Joshua than he may have done in the past um, again, against past opponents. Because... You know, um, it's all about, he's, he's talking about timing his punches in this fight. Um, but you, 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 I, to, 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 to go back finally on what you were just saying there about, you're right, when you're a heavyweight champion, if you want to go on a long run, Larry Holmes, um, Joe Lewis, that's why they're so celebrated. Over 20 title defenses, both of them. And as you say, rightly say, Jay, in a division that oh, a jab can change it, a heavyweight fight. One punch, because force and weight, because there's more force with more weight, you know, kind of in, in, in physical terms, you know, it's physical laws. It's, a, it's, it's the most perilous division to be in, in terms of being knocked out or being stopped. Any heavyweight can get knocked out, you know. So, you know, it, it, you're right, he walks a tightrope. Um, and also, there's so much pressure on him and so much expectation because you've got the insiders in, in, in the sports of boxing that understand the perilous path he walks right now. But the mainstream who adore him, who, who see him as this Adonis, this Adonis-like figure, are not aware of the perils that face him in this division. It's a fascinating journey. He's a fascinating story. I mean, he talked about being on remand yesterday when we were with him and about the, the, the bad times in his life and the foundations he wants to create. But it's nice to, to be around him. It's nice to be on his journey because um, I think he's, a fas he's one of the great fascinating stories, like Conor McGregor, like Brian O'Driscoll. He, he has great, great star quality. Just one last point on, on that, because just as the names you mentioned there in terms of Joe Lewis and Mike Tyson, I know he's mentioned Floyd Mayweather this week, but does he have a sense of history? Does he have a sense of how storied the heavyweight division is and how it's probably kind of the most exciting historically piece of sport that we've ever seen, really? Yeah, I think he does, but I also think he has um, another sense with that, Owen, where he, um, he's got, he knows that in, in boxing, statistics often lie. Um, as they do in all sports in some ways, that history paints a different picture sometimes. You know, um, people look back on, on, um, on Joe Lewis's record or on Larry Holmes's record, and there are bums on those records, bums as we would call people, people call, call fight, some fighters tomato cans, or there were fighters on their records who had no chance of beating them. Um, and I think he's very aware of, of history in that sense. Um, I think one of his targets is to be considered down the line. You know, Lennox Lewis is the greatest British heavyweight of all time. I don't think anyone would dispute that. But if Anthony Joshua, I think he's aware if he can get anywhere near the, and develop himself and uh, get anywhere near the, the, the standing, if you like, that Lennox Lewis had, um, he will go down as, as one of the great fighters. What he's got to do, of course, is beat Joseph Parker. He's got to unify the belts, arguably fight Deontay Wilder if he still holds it when they fight. Very interestingly, this weekend, by the way, Deontay Wilder was working on the Sky Sports team on commentary, but now isn't coming, apparently, which I think is very odd. Um, and, you know, if he can win seven, eight fights, I think if he can win seven, eight fights in a row and fight most of these guys 
once or twice and defeat Tyson Fury and then go around again and, and, meet, and, and beat the next four or five guys and improve with every contest. I think we will be looking at a guy who will be considered, well, you know, one of, the, one of the modern heavyweight greats. But he's got a long way to go, and, and we know there are vulnerabilities. We've seen him poleaxed already by, by Vladimir Klitschko, who has a very heavy right hand uh, 11 months ago. Um, but, you know, it all comes down to performances on the night, and, you know, if he can keep the, the, the gravy train, if you like, going. Because at the moment, boxing is riding high, and a lot of it, gents, is as a result of the slipstream of Anthony Joshua. Yeah. I'll talk to you about somebody else in the slipstream in just a minute, but just to go back to the, the Wilder point, any idea why he's not coming or what the speculation is about that? Do you know what? If I knew that, I'd be a very, very wealthy psychologist. Yeah. Um, I mean, God, I, I, it, it, it beggars belief. I was out at Deontay Wilder's fight against Luis Ortiz about three weeks ago, Jan, and, um, you know, all he would talk about off air was, you know, I want the fight with Anthony Joshua. I don't know whether... Dillian White's victory at the weekend over the Australian Lucas Brown, which makes him the, uh, con continues him, if you like, as the number one WBC contender or challenger, um, has has put uh, Deontay Wilder off that he's going to get Dillian White in his ear the whole time he's here. Um, but you know the whole point. I, I, I under, I'll, I'll reveal this. I can I understand that contractually, part of Wilder's deal about being in the broadcast team is to be flown over obviously paid to be on the broadcast team a handsome sum but part of the contract was that he would step into the ring afterwards and stand and do a face-off with the winner now i don't know who knows um you know his daughter has spina bifida he may have family issues so i don't want to say that he he's done this for for some fistic reason or um you know, for, for some kind of protest against one of his opponents, whether it be Hearn, Eddie Hearn, the promoter, who he doesn't like, whether it be Anthony Joshua or Dillian White. But, um, you know, because it could be some familial issue. But it's very odd that he's not coming, because this is a big moment. The world's watching this moment. It's the first time for seven years that, uh, that two heavyweight belts have, uh, have been unified, you know, that by holders of the belts. It's the first time in the UK we've had... Um, you know, three belts on the line. The first time we've had it, a, a unified heavyweight fight, believe it or not, in the UK. Um, and the first time, I think, for a very, very long time, that two undefeated heavyweight fighters have fought for a, a unification fight. So he should be here. It's a very, very odd scenario, and that is all I know at the moment. Yeah. We're, like, we're looking forward to the build-up to that fight, and the best way to kick that off is to hop in the ring afterwards and go, oh, that was nothing. Wait till you see what I'm going to do. Like, I... I does this kick back the time frame? Are we now looking at not at the potential of this not being a 2018 fight and more likely a 2019 fight? So, sorry, Joe, I just missed you at the end there. Are we now looking at a, a potential Parker Wilder? Sorry, yeah, a Joshua Deontay Wilder fight being a 2019 as opposed to a 2018 possibility. I, I think it was always 2019, Joe. I've said it all along. I, I don't, I, even though Anthony Joshua and Eddie Hearn, his promoter, are, are constantly saying they want to unify the belts this year, my feeling and the history of the division d generally dictates that these things are not rushed. It gives it time for the big fight to breathe. Um, and th th there's, been, there's an opportunity missed here on Saturday night if Deontay Wilder doesn't come because it's that photo moment. It's that moment where Wilder's kind of almost spitting in Joshua's face, ranting at him. It's that moment that goes viral. It's that moment, as we've seen, the moments that, that make $600 million fights, as we saw with Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather, the moments that people remember, the, the, the press tours. The, and, and if he's not there... Um, I don't see it happening this year. No, I mean, you know, we, we need a build-up. It's a very, it's the biggest fight in the heavyweight division. Um, I don't think it'll happen this year. No, I think it will. Uh, I think other things will happen. I think there'll be mandatories afterwards. Um, WBA and IBF mandatories, maybe even WBO mandatory if Joshua wins. And I do expect him to win between rounds about I don't know seven to ten, six to nine on Saturday night. I do think he'll get to Parker eventually, if Parker doesn't get to him early.
One last question for you then about Ryan Burnett. Um, we obviously huge fans of, of him and the, the backstory that he has is, is absolutely remarkable. Um, taking on the fights that he's taking on at the moment, though, again, it's a high wire act because there's no guarantee that he is actually going to be uh, still a champion at the end of this weekend. Well, look, the thing is about Ryan Burnett. I think he's already achieved brilliant things. You know, you talk about Anthony Joshua's... Um, Experience. Ryan's only eighteen and zero. Remember, with nine knockouts. Um, but he, you know, he, he's twenty five. He, he's he's done a brilliant thing coming over to the UK. He was under Ricky Hatton for a while, of course, um, up in Manchester. I met that's the first time I met him. Must have been I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago now. And uh, uh, and now he's he's uh, under the brilliant Adam Booth. I will say that I think Adam Booth is brilliant as he is with with another Irishman, of course, uh, Michael Conlon, gents, who I think is going to be a massive star. Um, over in the States, and I think he'll eventually usurp Carl Frampton uh, as, as the most followed man uh, in the North and maybe even the South of Ireland, um, you know, in the Republic of Ireland, rather. And, um, you know, he's up against a tough guy in um, Jon Fris Barejo on, on Saturday night. Um, you know, he, he's a very, very tough fighter, very experienced from Venezuela, 31 years old uh, of age. Um, you know, not a big knockout merchant like, like Ryan. He's, you know, these guys... Uh, uh, at this weight, uh, you know, we talk about knockouts for heavyweights. At this weight, these guys generally go through 12-round wars, you know. He's, he's been knocked out once um, against Zanat Zakinov, um, of course, who we know all about, um, you know, because uh, uh, Ryan has a victory over him. So I think that augurs well for this contest that Zakinov um, managed to knock out uh, um, Parejo, and, and I do think Ryan will come through it. What worries me with Ryan is that he seems to be in a war at this level every single time he fights. And you talked about longevity and not staying in the game too long, Owen. Um, and I think this is the key with, with Ryan. Um, he's already stated that he, he wants to get in, buy some properties, buy a house for him and his girlfriend, or maybe his wife, but it's his partner, and uh, have a family and just secure his future. Um, I just hope he doesn't stay around for another 20-odd fights. Gareth, great stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Absolute pleasure, gents.